and we have now the talk of uh, Hannah Samarzia, University of Zagreb, and the title is Epistemic Implications of Neuro Architecture. Please, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the subtitle is What Neuroscience Can and What Can Teach Us About Space for a Reason, and this is highly linked to what I would say in conclusion, so keep this in mind. Uh, First of all, let's recall by abstract, now we're not enforcing the abilities again, especially not with, upon this size, but I just wanted to recall some of our basic facets and the settings we'll be talking about. Uh, so to begin with, why are the topics of architecture, especially of interiors and built environments, so important now and possibly even more important than they were, than they were in the past? Well, this is because in uh, contemporary culture, in these circumstances, we are spending more time than ever in built environments. Uh, not only do we work in built environments, but the leisure we seek, the many forms of meaningful leisure which we might desire, we also do in built environments. And thus, architecture is no longer just some sort of aesthetic preferences or something strictly utilitarian, but it becomes a very large and important determinant of the ways we perceive our everyday lives, the ways we perceive our identities, our work, and ourselves at the very end. Uh, I will be talking about this from the perspective of new architecture, and this is a very novel discipline which is using new, art, new uh, neurological research to think about the ways in our environments uh, in that condition using very new technologies which I will be talking about um, in the continuation. Uh, since we'll be covering several decades of very specific research in basically half an hour, uh, this is a very rough structure of the presentation. Uh, so I will uh, introduce the topic by talking about the role of philosophy and architecture in contemporary science and why they're becoming more and more interlinked with uh, natural sciences. Uh, then from the perspective of architecture, I will uh, introduce you to the most important institution for conducting neuroscientific research today, and that would be the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture in San Diego. Uh, I will briefly explain the neuroarchitectural methodology and its possible applications in education, medicine, and office spaces. We'll have many examples to make this to make this as illustrative as possible. From the perspective of philosophy, as a slight disclaimer, uh, even though the title talks about the epistemological uh, implications, I will be uh, mostly limited to the philosophy of mind, which has overtaken many traditional epistemological topics, such as uh, the topics of qualia, intentionality, and also um, the ways we uh, form and revise memories. Uh, I will also offer a critical uh, onlook on neuroscience as a discipline and its methodological uh, basically boundaries, uh, and I will explore the final and very important constitutive element of architecture, and that is the domain of the social, or the ways our uh, cultures and environments affect the ways we perceive spaces, leading to my conclusion, uh, which you will see at the end. Uh, I, will, I listed all the references at the end if somebody would be interested in some further reading. Uh, so first of all, before the 1840s, uh, philosophy was used as this sort of umbrella term which would have covered everything from social sciences to natural sciences, meaning uh, if you were engaged in uh, physics or biology, you were doing what was called natural philosophy. There was moral philosophy which dealt in topics such as ethics or psychology, and there were metaphysics which dealt in ontology. But following the 1840s, there, there became a large shift. Uh, natural sciences, sciences separated, social sciences such as uh, sociology and psychology had also separated, and philosophy was left with a much uh, narrower scope of its possible research interests, and it also uh, became highly institutionalized, highly academic, so you suddenly had uh, philosophers at universities and philosophers mostly at universities. Uh, since natural sciences are becoming more and more popular, uh, certain philosophical topics, such as those related to consciousness, those related to um, doxatic states, belief formation, memories, revision, or credibility and testimony, became, um, they became somewhat criticized because the main philosophical methodology is that of abstract thinking, namely armchair thinking, and uh, interpersonal dialogue, and it seemed that perhaps both social and natural sciences now had better equipment, better research apparatus for attacking these topics adequately. And this is why philosophy became very engaged with the cognitive sciences, which research human cognition from the perspective, from a computational perspective, but they also study uh, how we approach basically our objects, how we come to see them, how we interpret them. 
Uh, and, basic, and this collaboration has been very fruitful. In fact, uh, cognitive science has proven some ancient philosophical theories. Uh, today we've mentioned Stoicism, so many of you might be familiar with the Stoic concept of proelesis, uh, or the uh, actually action of postponing your emotional reaction in order to engage some more rational thinking. Uh, so cognitive sciences have actually proven, this is now used as a therapeutical method, that emotional reactions are mostly impulsive, they are habitual, and you might largely benefit from postponing this reaction in order to separate the things you can affect and those that you can affect, which was an ancient stoic idea. Uh, on the other hand, architecture has also been, in many ways, though mostly ab abstractly, uh, taking into account here scientific knowledge. Uh, these applications have been very rare. Uh, these are some of the most prominent examples, and they haven't really been practically implemented. Uh, neuroscience was first found in the 18th and 19th centuries, and its founding father, Mr. Kayal, uh, came with the idea that basically human brains develop up until adulthood, and after that they enter this progressive state of a rapid decay. So there is no way that your brain can regenerate or grow new cells after you basically reach the age, the age of 20. Uh, this idea has been radically refuted uh, in the last century. It was first refuted in the 60s, but this idea became super popular somewhere in the 90s or the early 2000s. Uh, with the concept of neuroplasticity or the idea that our brains change throughout our lives, and mostly in response to our behavior, our thoughts, and our environment. Uh, knowing this, architecture seems to face two new ethical imperatives. So first of all, it, it seems as if architecture should take into account what neuroarchitecture has to say about what sorts of spatial settings or spatial features would be best suited to particular uh, usages, such as, for example, schools, hospitals, or office spaces. Uh, the other imperative, which might seem more ethically binding, is that the architecture must know what cannot go in certain spaces because it actively harms people. So if you make a hospital which actively harms the patients, you're not only being morally irresponsible on an abstract level, level but you're actively doing harm. And also, architecture has never had exactly the same role as other forms of aesthetic pleasure. So it could never limit itself to being pure beauty or pure design, because it always had uh, what was previously referred to as its anthropological function. Basically, its, uti its utility and its uh, role in forming your everyday lives. Uh, so, um, currently, new architectural research is mostly done at the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture, or the NAFA. Its finder was John Evanhag. He was a classical architect from America. He graduated somewhere in the 60s, which was a very intense era for architecture because this is when uh, modernism and the idea that ornament is crime started part of, part of the rising. And Evanhag was originally interested in gothical churches. And he graduated into the world that no longer needed his services. Now architecture was doing something radically different. So he realized he needed to find other perhaps even to metrically different interests. He was first engaged in making uh, computer programs, which were sort of the predecessors of today's AutoCAD and the other architectural programs for design. Uh, and he soon started collaborating with scientists from the Salk Institute in California. The idea of neuroarchitecture was first given rise when he started collaborating with Fred Gage, a neuroscientist who did uh, experiments on mice. Uh, he saw that basically putting mice in different environments heavily influenced the ways their brains developed, the ways they acted, the, way, the ways they behaved in space. And this idea would remain abstract, uh, would have remained abstract, if it wasn't for Norman Coons, the president of the American uh, Architectural Association, who encouraged them to find the uh, academy in 2003 in San Diego. The academy got huge monetary grants, and ever since then it's been conducted very wide, all-encompassing research about the possibly universal facets of human cognition, which might help us make better and more utilitarian architecture. Uh, the previous pictures on the previous slides are actually a, a monastery in Assisi, in Italy. So the very founder of the Salk Institute, Jonas Salk, he was a virologist, he was famous for discovering the cure for polio or child paralysis, and famously he couldn't find a cure for decades and decades. He then retreated to this monastery in Assisi, and, and uh, when he came back to America, he immediately found a cure for polio. Uh, when he was later found how he uh, asked how he had done it, 
uh, he uh, completely attributed his entire uh, success to the intellectually refreshing environment of the uh, monastery in Assisi, and he actually encouraged this health institute also to monetarily and researchly uh, support uh, every sort of new architectural interest. Uh, this uh, final point about the necessity of performance design uh, recalls the tale of Stanley Raven. He was actually a, a he was a doctor who worked in a, Cali in a Californian hospital uh, at the domain for prematurely born children. And he had found that uh, if you design these areas wrong, these children are going to have to develop the sense of sight much earlier than nature had intended, and as adults, they would have huge problems with their eyesight and with their hearing. So basically, making architecturally incorrect spaces such as hospitals becomes uh, some sort of moral transgression. Uh, if these concepts seem either intuitive or familiar, this is because they are, and the, co and the concept of functional design, or basically design meant for humans, is very old, but it's mostly been based on behaviorist research. But the problem with behavioral methodology is that it's very unempirical and it's very subjective. So this was mostly done, you'd take a group of, of, group, a group of examiners, you'd put them into some sort of exi existing building, and you would monitor their behavior. So this was obviously problematic because you would have a scientist who is very theoretically subjective, monitoring a group of state strangers and trying to infer some sort of universal conclusion from their behavior. There was also the idea of uh, interviewing the examinants after they visited the space, but this was also very unsuccessful because they had large problems with articulating their, their experiences and their interpretations of spaces, and in the end they mostly refer um, start using cliches like they go to a church and say the church is monumental, which truly wasn't very informative. On the other hand, neuroscience has recently developed what is known as the FMR technology, meaning functional uh, magnetic resonance. And this allows you to see in real time which areas of an individual's brain are lighting up in response to a certain spatial stimulus. Uh, so this can be done in two specific ways. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, Participants may wear these wireless helmets, which monitor their brains in actual built environments. So if you're trying to see how people react to a very specific church, which is which cannot be replicated because it's too complex, you can give them these helmets and put them in this environment. There is also the concept of virtual reality. This is very fruitful and very new. Uh, it, uh, the, uh, the technology is called the cave cat technology. It looks somewhat like this, just now it's more realistic. Basically, people are put into these stimulated spaces, which can be altered however the researchers may want. And they can navigate the spaces using specific joysticks, so researchers can vary different uh, architectural and spatial settings in order to see which settings these people will react to the best and then make architectural suggestions. Uh, in order to understand uh, what neuroarchitecture actually deals with, we need to understand the concept of consciousness. So it's been a big, big problem for uh, neuroscience, but also for philosophy of mind and for philosophy in general, also for phenomenology. And it's commonly referred to as to this upper level of mental life uh, of a conscious individual who, who knows who is having an experience and knows that they're having an experience. Uh, so most architects use the distinction made by Antonio Damasio, an American uh, philosopher slash neuroscience scientist, in his book The Feeling of What Happens. Uh, so he makes a distinction between uh, immediate or momentary consciousness and extended or interpretive consciousness. And since these are very abstract concepts, I will try to explain them on uh, an example so we can imagine what I'm talking about. So this is Shigeru Ban's Tokyo uh, Curtain Wall House in Tokyo. And uh, it, let's understand it like this. So immediate or momentary consciousness is this sort of pre-interpretative process. It's basically the influx of all sorts of sensory stimuli. So if you walked into this space, your uh, immediate consciousness would be just this accumulation of sensory input. So you would uh, notice the whiteness of the walls. You would notice, notice the smooth surfaces. You would hear the rustling of the curtains. You would notice the transparency of the linen, and you would probably feel the breeze coming in. Uh, but this would be completely pre-interpretive, so you wouldn't be thinking about this. It would, it would just be what the Masio calls the feeling of what happens. And how do our brains perceive spaces? So, uh, the example of this room. First, they try to grasp the size and the shape of the room, and then they map your body in space. 
And this is very close to what Ponty had uh, basically anticipated decades and decades before, because we form our conceptions of space uh, on the, with the reference of our bodies. Uh, on the other level of consciousness, which would be extended or interpreted, consciousness engages you as an individual who has an idea of themselves as a unique human being with a unique personal identity and a unique uh, past. So at this point you would be thinking about what sort of architecture you enjoy, about your previous experiences, you would suddenly be thinking about whether you will like spaces which are bare, spaces which are simplicity, whether you enjoy modernist architecture. And when we're talking about new architecture, what this deals with is this basically the pre-interpretative sensory part. This sort of uh, experiential or identity-based interpretation uh, is the topic of something else which I will, co which I will come back to later. Uh, returning to these epistemic implications about how uh, environments influence cognition, one of the first and one of the large research, uh, largest uh, research projects done by the NAFA uh, was in 2005. And this was research about how educational spaces influence the ways uh, children learn. Uh, they made five basic hypotheses, uh, the, uh, these five. Uh, I, I will be the ones that I will try to explain briefly. So the basic ideas were that spaces which are large, we have, which have high ceilings, which are abundantly lit with natural light, and which have abundant access to uh, either artificial or real greenery, and which encourage some sort of inter interaction between students, uh, will cater to cognitive development, also to the for formation of beliefs, memories, and to feelings of wakefulness, attention, and focus, and thus to academic performance. Uh, basic new architectural uh, research looks like this. So first you postulate a hypothesis, you guess you guess uh, what uh, physiological reactions might happen. You test these predictions on actual examinants, and if they prove correct, you can make concrete uh, suggestions to architects. Uh, so the first hypothesis was that natural light encourages wakefulness and focus, and undesirable prevalence, prevalence of artificial lightning interferes with natural sleep cycles or circadian rhythms, and is less likely, uh, likely to produce heightened states of stress that hinder academic performance. Educational spaces require a strictly defined balance of natural and artificial lightning. So this is a table of how it might be done. Uh, so let's just fo focus and limit ourselves to the areas of natural lightning. Uh, so when they uh, scanned the examiner's brains in, responses to, in response to abundant natural light, uh, they uh, saw heightened activity in the occipital region and in the parietal region. And these are the regions of the brain uh, which are in charge of attention and focus. Uh, also, they measured the amount of melatonin, which is the primary sleep hormone in their saliva, and then noticed that in spaces which are abundantly naturally lit, this, uh, these levels were much lower, so the examinants were able to remain very wakeful, very attentive, and very focused for prolonged periods of time. And, and uh, how does this reflect on behavior? So they're more attentive, uh, they learn easier, they have better relationships, they feel more comfortable in school, and of course they have better academic performance as a result. Uh, how, we, how, I, how might we, we use this in an architectural context? With uh, wide windows, with natural light, and which colors and textures would enhance reflection. Another aspect was that static artificial lightning, uh, which would probably happen if we were to, if, there weren't these diffused multiple uh, lamps, but one in the very middle, which was very bright. This interferes, interferes with natural circadian rhythms. The body is confused by seeing this light, which is completely incongruent with what it expects, which causes heightened states of, states of stress, which doesn't only decrease focus and wakefulness, it also weakens your immune system. It makes you more success successful to headaches, stomach aches, and thus in many ways hinders academic performance. This high school complex in California called the Corona del Mar complex was built exactly with new architecture in mind. And if we pay attention, we can see that many uh, features are actually used in this complex. So you can see that the uh, entrance park uh, has, uh, has plenty of greenery, and if the students choose to rest on one of these benches, they can actually enjoy abundant greenery, they can rest and uh, get some sort of positive distraction from their studies which will facilitate more wakefulness and learning later on. You can see there are no solid walls. All the walls are permeated by these small incisions, which allow for plenty of natural lightning throughout the day. 
Um, you can also see that there is no centralized static lightning. There is diffused lights everywhere, so which which gives the impression of some sort of natural ambient even during evening hours. Also, it's very clever how the complex doesn't have uh, secluded corridors. The corridor corridors aren't walled in. The corridors are formed as bridges. So while moving from one classroom to another, children have to uh, take some sort of brisk walk. Uh, they get to gaze at actu actual natural light on the, at, at the exterior, and, and they can see green spaces, which will make them more restful. Uh, also, the place, of the uh, area for uh, community and for socializing isn't even on the same level as the rest of the high school complex. So they're, so they're encouraged to take an actual break, Me meaning they have to walk, they have to sit in small clusters and devote some time to interaction only, uh, which, encourages spatial, which encourages interpersonal integration, feelings of community and more connection with others. Uh, moving on to medicine, uh, we've already said that failing to meet cert certain architectural standings actually violates the Hippocratic Oath, either help or do not harm the patients. So if you build a hospital which actively harms your patients, you are doing serious medical misconduct. Uh, the largest existing research was done in the 80s by Robert Ulrich. It was called How Design Impacts Wellness. Wellness it has dozens of pages, but his basic ideas are um, that Hospitals should be as simple as possible because patients already feel as if they have limited control over their lives and well-beings. So if, if they cannot find their way through the hospital, they become very stressed, they become much less likely to recover in due time. Um, also, patients heavily benefit from large amounts of greenery and vegetation, and this isn't only on an abstract level. Uh, plants have been shown to actually reduce pain, like physically reduce pain, in as, li in as little as 4 to 5 minutes. Uh, also, they benefit from positive distractions. These can be greenery, they can also be paintings. Um, the best paintings would be those which are depicting greenery or which are depicting uh, small pets or smiling human faces. Uh, this, this is a very old study, so it's very specific. Uh, a good example is this med medical pavilion in North Carolina by Duke University. It was also built with new architecture in mind, so you can see um, that all the colors are very light, they're very muted, they're very unobtrusive, they're also very early to encourage feelings that is to replicate a natural environment and not be overwhelming. Uh, the entrance pavement is also abundant with greenery and if patients want to sit down and rest and have a coffee, they are going to be inevitably surrounded by lots of green spaces. Uh, if you gaze at the interior, you can see that uh, all textures are very soft, the colors are still muted, and if you pay uh, closer attention, you can see they even actually put a picture depicting uh, natural scenery to make both uh, patients and guests feel more relaxed. Uh, I've previously mentioned how higher ceilings encourage creativity and lower ceilings encourage attention to detail. So you can see how surgical rooms have much lower ceilings than the rest of the hospital. Uh, at the end, you can also see that the corridors, again, aren't walled in, they're completely lined with windows. So when patients are walking through, they can also look at green spaces, they can get some sort of positive distraction, which will foster their recovery. Uh, dealing with your architecture and office spaces, the demands are the same as in education, so you're looking for attention, you're looking for a focus, you're looking for positive interpersonal relationships. Uh, and a good example would be the aforementioned Salk Institute in California. And since we've already said that Jonas Salk attributed his success at finding the cure for portfolio to architecture, it was very important to him to make his institute more architecturally perfect. Uh, so the entire, uh, the, the entire institute was built in, uh, exclusively using raw concrete in these shades of pale beige. Um, and, all, and again, we see a very familiar architectural feature, so the corridors, again, aren't walled in, they're bridges to encourage interaction with external environments and to encourage people walking, getting some aerobic exercise and talking to each other. Uh, all the colors are actually were closely, very meticulously picked to mimic the Californian scenery uh, and actually the beaches of the Pacific Ocean and the institute is supposed to sort of seamlessly blend in with the surrounding environment uh, in order to replicate the way the Pacific Ocean actually looks. Uh, the pool was, is, actually, is lit with turquoise lightning from the bottom 
Um, you can see how the color scheme is very, very precisely maintained throughout the institute. So there's always the same beige concrete and, all, and the only type of wood which the architect, uh, I think um, it was Khan, uh, used is very pale teak. And uh, another, another interesting prospect is that the outer sides of the windows are lined in raw, completely unmodulated wood. Uh, because there's been research that people react positively to raw materials because they activate our evolutionary neural recognition of natural shapes. Uh, so, coming back to philosophy, I've already said that the separation of natural science, sciences has made it somewhat evident that very specific topics such as cognition, learning processes, mental properties, intentionality and qualia can be perhaps more precisely explained or more empirically explained or numerically explained by the natural sciences. Uh, certain uh, contemporary epistemologists and, philosoph and philosophers of mind, such as for example Thomas Nagel, have actually said that a problem such as the mind-body problem and consciousness are unsolvable at this level of scientific research, but later on with a paradigm shift we might fill in this explanatory gap. And what's interesting is that he, he doesn't say that philosophy will be the one to, re to resolve it. Science will be the one to resolve it, but philosophy of mind can be here to give good suggestions or to encourage new forms of research or to be this sort of theoretical commentator which encourages new streams of thinking. And for these reasons, philosophy of mind has started engaging inputs not only from cognitive sciences but also from evolutionary psychology and from neuroscience. Uh, a very important uh, problem in the philosophy of mind is the concept of mind-brain identity. So this is a very old idea and it basically states that every sort of mental process, no matter what, matter what we might we be talking about, we might be talking about habits or thoughts or emotions, that they have their very specific biological correlate. And in neuroscience this has actually been empirically irrefutable for a very long time, the concept would be there can be no change in the mental states of a person without the change in brain states. So every emotion, every reaction, every thought has its very specific and fitting neural correlate. Uh, in philosophy of mind, this is uh, articulated as the identity, identity theory of mind, this is even more radical, and it's the idea that mental states are entirely reducible to their uh, neurological correlates. Uh, there's also been a linguistic perspective, perspective on this, offered by Ludwig Wittgenstein. He actually said that the mind-body problem is an illusory problem because um, there are many ways to talk about, for example, mental states and neural processes. You can talk about them either in uh, psychological terms as mental states, as emotions, or you can talk about them in biological terms, talking about neural processes, but you're basically talking about the same thing. You're just talking about them in different contexts. So if this really were such, so if every mental state was truly entirely reducible to a fitting neural correlate, what would philosophy actually have to do? Would philosophy simply have to, over, to give over and hand over all of its topics to neuroscience and simply stand at the back and sometimes often offer an irrelevant comment? Well, no. Um, recent, uh, many prominent neuroscientists have actually been highly skeptical of recent neuroscientific development um, especially since there's been a rise in a very specific sort of domain of research, uh, some sort of popular neuroscience. So the prefix neuro has been uh, functioning with this sort of trendy epithet, which, which you can put under nearly everything. So there's been neuropolitics, there's been neurolaw, neurogastronomy, neuroeconomy, and not all of these are very empirically weighty. Uh, neuroscience has many uh, limitations. So first of all, um, Scientists are very prone to conduct either ambiguity or a misinterpretation, meaning if you do fMR scanning and a certain part of your brain lights up, this doesn't mean that other parts are inactive, it doesn't mean that you can infer some sort of universal and definitely co correct conclusion from this. Um, and also, uh, research into the brain is very young, it's only been done for several decades, and we cannot be completely sure that we know everything the certain area of the brain does. And a much larger problem is the lack of universality, meaning uh, neurological research is expensive and it takes a very long time. So it's mostly done on faculties 
and the examiners are mostly students, meaning if you're doing neurological research, you're taking a very similar group of people. These people are the same age, they come from very similar socio-cultural backgrounds, and if you're going to get some sort of neurological response, it's very likely that they're going to respond in exactly the same way, because they were brought up in the same place, under the same conditions, and they were exposed to the same inputs. So coming back to the topics of philosophy of mind and epistemology. Uh, so the question is, did, did epistemology disappear? Did it wither away or just become very weak after philosophy of mind had like, taken some of its topics, after, uh, for example, psychology and, uh, and sociology had taken other of its topics? Well, no. It simply found another domain of its interest. So traditional, traditional epistemology, the way it studied cognition, the way it studied belief formation, it focused on the concept of an individual epistemic agent, knower, cognizer, however you like, who basically knows and, for, and forms opinions and beliefs in some sort of social vacuum, so uh, without any sort of external influence. And in the 80s appeared, the, uh, yeah, in the 80s, under the uh, guise of Alvin Goldman, appeared what, what is now known as a very fruitful area of research known as social epistemology. Basically the idea that we are all socially situated knowers, we can only form beliefs, we can only form interpersonal relationships, we can only trust testimonies or give testimonies under, under, the, uh, under the influence of power dynamics, under the, under the influence of how society is formed. So does this uh, new uh, concept of, of uh, investigating the epistemic effects of social interactions somehow jeopardize the interaction of philosophy and scientists? Absolute, absolutely not. Actually, the very pioneer of social epistemology, Alvin Goldman, has emphasized the importance of still engaging not only the natural sciences, but also sociology and psychology in his book, Liaisons. Uh, anyway, let's return to architecture. There's the concept of socially situated architecture. This is something very intuitive. It's something that is plainly evident in everyday life. So not, not all cultures have the same idea of what is comfortable, what is familiar, or what is domestic bliss. And there's been this very illustrative example very recently. Um, the Swedish retail giant, IKEA, has come under fire because they've been found to Photoshop their catalogs to sell to different countries. And this is the example. So this is the kitchen that was sold to the American market. Uh, let's compare this with a picture that was sold to the Chinese market. Uh, you can see that the American kitchen is much larger. So why is this so? The Americans are notorious for having a very specific housing market, meaning that Americans have much larger houses and they're accustomed to living in much larger spaces than, as you can see, the Chinese have the smallest houses and the smallest living spaces. So basically, you couldn't sell the Ch a Chinese buyer this sort of huge space. It would be unfamiliar, it would look too big, and it would look uncomfortable. And also, you couldn't uh, sell something which is so cozy, so small, and so restricted to an American buyer who is expecting something very large. And from, your, from a new architectural perspective, both of these are good. Both of these are airy, both of these have uh, plenty of lightning, both of these uh, foster natural colors. But still, you would have a culture which is heavily opposed to this, and you would have a culture which is heavily opposed to this. Another good example is extreme Japanese minimalism. And, for, and this sort of ten tendency for absolute and extreme reduction is very deeply rooted in this, uh, cult these cultural ethics of work, of dedication, of uh, evaluating yourself in terms of your success, in terms of what you do, uh, in opposition to what you have. But whenever Westerners cover these types of stories, they describe them either as extreme ascetism or some sort of domestic masochism. Uh, but, however, the example which I think is most illustrative is the uh, fate of American versus the fate of European brutalism. So all of you are probably familiar with the very concept of brutalism. It has nothing to do with brutality, it has to do with brute or raw concrete. But what's interesting is that brutalism wasn't introduced to America and to Europe for the very same reasons. Uh, so brutalism emerged in America in the 60s as some sort of aesthetic statement. It was a revision of the early stages of modernism. It was a revision of Le Corbusier, it was a revision of, uh, of uh, Mies van der Rohe, with the idea of technological progress. So rock concrete was a very a new material, uh, a cloak of a new era, of an era where technology will be able to do everything. And uh, you, 
can see these buildings are no longer of the opinion that ornament is crime. They're no longer strictly functional, they, they're ornamented, they're very specific and they're aesthetically very interesting. It was the idea of looking forward, it was the idea of offering something different. On the other hand, uh, in Europe, and especially in the Eastern European and Southeastern European bloc, brutalism was introduced because of necessity. Uh, there was the problem of housing as many people as possible on as little space as possible, as cheaply as possible. And brutalism was perfect. You could build these huge constructions. Uh, these are the raketed or the rockets in Zagreb. Uh, they have 15 floors with multiple flats on each floor. Um, brutalism was very cheap. It was very closely connected to socialist regimes or, the basic, or to various austerity measures. So very simply, no very positive connotations. But still, um, it, but still uh, brutalism was much more hated in America than it ever was uh, in Europe. Uh, why is this so? For, so for example, uh, in the left picture you can see uh, the Boston City Hall, which, which was so extremely hated that uh, many Boston majors actually used the promise of building it down as a significant political advantage. Uh, on the right you can see this housing block, which was also so extremely hated. The architect was, uh, his, surname was he, his name was Edna Goldfinger, and Ian Fleming actually named the Bond villain Goldfinger because of how much he hated this building. Uh, so brutalism was in, in, immensely hated in America. There was this uh, brutalist Yale uh, University complex, which the students actually tried to burn down. Uh, in a position, uh, brutalism was much more accepted in uh, Europe, it was even somewhat loved, and today it's being rehabilitated as a very interesting part of the European architectural heritage. Uh, but this isn't just some sort of cultural or social observation, this also has its neuroscientifically explicable uh, aspect. And this is a concept which I've already mentioned, and this is the concept of neuroplasticity or learning throughout your life. Uh, the quote that the job or the man can, be, can, can get used to anything is actually an old quote for Dostoevsky, but it very nicely summarizes the issue. So neuroplasticity is the idea that our brains change continuously and without end throughout our lives in response to various stimuli. Uh, what we're particularly interested in is the idea of activity-dependent neuroplasticity or the fact that our brains change uh, in response to our behavior, our environments, and also our thoughts and emotions. Uh, this is because our brains are very, econom very economical organs, so your brain has no interest in preserving those activities which you don't often do, but, but it has in its interest to make things you do on a daily basis, your habits, your things you're very interested in doing, uh, it has an, it's in its interest to make them as easy and as automatic as possible. So whatever thing you think you repeat often, whatever thought or activity, you, you repeat every day for a prolonged period of time, this activity becomes actually physically embedded in your brain to become as easy as possible. And this is how we form habits, this is how we get used to certain things. And uh, what I must highlight here is that thoughts and values are as easily embedded as habits and behaviors. So if you see some sort of architectural setting or architectural style and you always have the same reaction to it. For example, a very simple reaction such as, it's nice. It will become natural and habitual to you to perceive it as nice. Uh, so let's try to explain how this influenced the fate of brutalism. So in America, brutalism emerged as some sort of aesthetic statement. Brutalist buildings were rare. People weren't, um, people couldn't see them often enough to become accustomed. They were simply something new. They were something they were completely unaccustomed to. They were brutal, they were raw, they were dehumanizing, they were cold, they were threatening. And here you can see a Chicago library, which was, which was very interesting, but which was, torn, which was torn down because it didn't look like the surrounding buildings and it was immensely hated. Uh, in the second picture, you can again see Zagreb Sakete, which are now very popular, which are a very desirable place to live. The flats are rented for very high amounts. And why, why did brutalism survive in Europe? Because it was common enough, and, it, and people were exposed to it to such a degree, at such a level, that they could actively get used to it. Uh, so, as my conclusion, we are coming to an end. 
uh, the idea of strict new architecture is something which is universal, which is obviously untenable for these two, the two reasons. So, for example, uh, if people can genuinely adapt to different settings as, as long as they see them for often enough, then new architecture is unnecessary. Uh, also, if the new architectural research is incorrect because it cannot amount for different socio-cultural backgrounds, then it's, just, then it's just mean logically unrealistic because if you wanted to be responsible, you would need to have this huge group of examinants coming from different cultures. But there's the idea of moderate neuroarchitecture or the concept of hybridizing the social and the neuroscientific. So basically we should just see in which circumstances it would be more responsible and more desirable to try to make them as neuroarchitecturally and as neuroscientifically applicable as possible. So we've seen that, for example, educational spaces, hospitals and office spaces can genuinely benefit from using these sort of findings. So if students and if people can actually be more attentive and more focused in well-lighted environments and they can be academically more successful, if you can encourage workers, co-workers, to interact and to feel closer together and less competitive but more uh, collaborative in a specific setting, this is the sort of setting you should use. On the other hand, commercial spaces can benefit from novelty because in these circumstances, uh, even emotions such as discomfort or something you're completely unused to can be beneficial because it can encourage thinking it can discourage, and it can encourage different perspectives. That will be it. Thank you. as uh, this uh, dialogue between architecture and neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we can press there is something to ask or comment. Yeah, uh, yes? thanks first. Uh, it's really interesting and uh, I guess a lot of new information. Um, my, my interest is especially about this um, necessity, maybe, the necessity of the neuroscience, uh, where can be the, the pure experience of ourselves, if maybe already not, where do we need neuroscience? I, I think in the, in the examples we, we talk about some, yeah, here is a bit of green, so people feel comfortable because it's green or, the, the ceilings of so the room. So we were talking about what sort of architecture would make us uh, feel more aware of ourselves. Uh, I just mean, um, it, for me, it first sounds like uh, we already know it without neuroscience. So I, I know from my experience. Yeah, it's very uh, intuitive. Yeah. Um, and this is how behaviorism used to work. So uh, most of this neuroscientific research is very intuitive because you know, uh, you notice the spaces you feel comfortable in. But now you have this sort of uh, scientific confirmation, and you also know, uh, and also, for example, if you go and see some greenery and you feel rested or you feel more comfortable, you can never be completely sure that it was the greenery. It might have also, you know, maybe maybe you were just having a good day. Maybe the building was very nice in itself. But you're, um, the only reason why neuroscience is used here is because it gives this sort of empirical or scientific precision that you can actually so show an exam examiner just greenery and you can immediately see that this was exactly the greenery that caused this sort of reaction. You can also see exactly what reaction was caused. So you might say, I feel good. Uh, in presence of greenery, but uh, neuroscience can tell you, yes, uh, he showed heightened uh, activity in his occipital region, meaning that greenery made him feel more rested, it made him feel as if uh, he could focus better on, his, uh, on whatever he would be working on next. Because otherwise, we can all probably experience that after a walk outside we do feel more rested, but we couldn't actually pinpoint which moment of the walk it was, or why specifically it was. So this is just that sort of empirical accuracy, which can occasionally be fruitful. Okay. So normally we could say if it's connected with the design process, if we have it in, like we built the building, and we can, before we build it, we can go through it, the virtual reality, and yes. scan our brains. Normally, 
that will be the perfect architecture after it because we can scan everything and then we say, okay, if we build it like this, it will definitely be perfect. Well, that will be the ideal version. Yes, and this is why virtual reality is so good because you can simulate a space before actually putting in the time and money into building it. Uh, and it's also good because the virtual reality demands very little actual monetary foundation. So you could, this could actually perhaps even cater to the social element because if you were, for example, building a school for Croatian children, you could see how Croatian children react and not just children in general. Or if you were building a German hospital, you could see how German patients react and not just patients in general. Yeah, yeah, just a brief um, comment. This is just an example, an analogical example. In Chile, there are lots of dogs. It's a third world country, which takes place in the first world country. So, lots of dogs. There are two kinds of dogs. The ones which live in the street, in very harsh conditions, and very, no food, whatever. And the ones which are raised in a rich home. The smartest ones, the more resilient ones, the most uh, self-sufficient ones, are the street ones. The other ones are dumb and weak because they have been raised in a very perfect climate. So, this is an example, okay, a bit harsh, but you know what I mean. Would it imply the, the possibility of developing this uh, neuroscientific uh, architecture in a larger scale in the whole world, I'm thinking of a, of a sort of utopian or dystopian thing. Eh? And would that imply that we would raise a whole generation of people who are more like less resilient and more <coughs> weak in a very broad sense, you know? Uh, in terms of maybe the harshness of life itself gives you the possibility of being more like adaptive and more resilient. Uh, well, uh, I completely get what you're saying. This is very interesting, but um, let's return to the example of um, education. So if you put kids for generations and generations in very badly designed student halls with horrible lightning, with tons of patterns, with static lightning which makes them have headaches and stomach aches, which makes them super stressed, which weakens their immune systems, and which worsens their academic performance, um, I don't... you would not... I, you wouldn't get these very resilient children who will learn how to perform well uh, despite these bad circumstances. You will just get a lot of children which could, which could have had it easier and which m maybe sh wouldn't have to experience these, these horrible conditions if you had thought about it before. Because the fact that they had it so bad now doesn't imply that they will be much better when they one day come to a more fitting or better suited environment. You yeah, just make it unnecessarily hard for them for the time being. But this implies that there's an underlying uh, educational paradigma in, in, in the approach. I mean, it's a very good example from your side, of course. You're right. But I'm talking about life as a sort of metaphysical general. You know? But I understand what you mean, of course. We take that case study 100% trying to expand a bit the, the notion of what it applies to deal with life. Well, I mean, you can, you can also develop resilience in interpersonal relationships. I mean, life has many layers, not all of them, and most of them are in architecture. So if you're only developing resilience in your uh, relationship to architecture, you're really not going to be very resilient, no matter what that architecture might be. Sure. Yes. Um, well, I'm I would like to do you my comment on your research. I think it was a really painful uh, <laughs> But uh, if I may ask, uh, some, if I may say something, I think it's uh, it's informal. It smells of death. You know, it it's uh, you you regard people in a, such a, a, a neuro neuroscience, not you personally. It regards people as object in general, as we saw in a previous presentation. You know, uh, they are uh, neglecting the very nature of people which is intuitive, and which is not uh, all in, in per se uh, culturally um, infected. Or, uh, you know, 
it is based on the idea of universality and the idea, you know, that uh, at the very end of, of what is the result, what is the project of neuroscience architecture? You know, what is the result? The people who are all the same or the people who are all reacting the same? Uh, um, uh, well, what what should we expect uh, uh, of that architecture? You know? Well, as I have said in the conclusion, the point isn't to create this sort of generic and dehumanizing architecture because you obviously cannot deny that humans are naturalistically, bodily, yes. very similar. So if there are some evolutionarily pro provable responses to, to certain architectural stimuli, and if you, I mean, do you think that architectural aesthetic freedom is heavily hindered by allowing natural light? Does this uh, sort of disrespect the plurality of our intuitiveness? I think that uh, plurality of our intuitiveness is um, the way things are. It's a priori. You know, it's something that you cannot, um, you cannot fabricate in a way. And it goes back to epistemology in itself, you know, because you are uh, having a certain system of knowledge which is structured in a certain way and this structures human behavior in a certain way and if you are trying to scientifically uh, gen generalize it um, it can, it can um, hinder the evolution as the uh, colleagues said like a few minutes ago you know, it's, it's an um, ambiguity of the concept of uh, neuroscience and neuroplasticity, right? Is, it, is that the term? Is, um, is that uh, it isn't, uh, it uh, neglects the idea that architecture should adapt itself, uh, should be read by the people, you know, in a way. Because we are, we are um, creating certain. Uh, as, you, as we saw in those examples from IKEA's catalog, mm -hmm. uh, those people are taught to think of certain kitchen as, um, as it was a kitchen, right? No, they're not thought to think of it as comfortable. They already think of it as comfortable. Yes, the but they acquired is it. They acquired it uh, through certain period. Of you know, or through their culture. Because they weren't, or, even, they weren't exposed to somebody who was trying to indoctrinate them to think that a certain space is more comfortable. This is because of the housing markets in their particular states. So we are talking about ideology of certain, that is dominant in certain states. That goes to that... Uh, We're talking people. about the way life is structured in a certain culture. Uh, just like every culture has because its own ways that people are used to living, the ways, just like other countries in which people purchase homes and per other countries in which people exclusively rent them. So if you have seen that the Chinese market only sells very small houses and apartments, nobody is indoctrinating them. This is the way everyone in China lives because of the high population density. It's more of a necessity than, than ideology. Well, yes, That's, uh, I agree with that. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation, kind of from provocative <laughs> presentation. Like for me, neuroscience or, or neuro research always smells on a, on, a, on a like performance, amazing performance. So it always, I feel it is always used unethically, almost always in marketing purposes, in usually in pack, package design. So if the if the bottle of the milk is white. It looks fresher, it tastes fresher as the milk bottle than the yellow. Yeah, and then, we, we're uh, all lucky that the neuromarketing is mostly very empirically inadequate, mostly very fake. Yeah. So what it proposes is something that objectifies the, the, the human being, as Miller said. And uh, in architecture we seem to be subjective and to give a, a subjective statement. If, like sometimes we try to be, architecture tries to be art. So I don't know, the, uh, it's like in modernism they try to produce the, this average space for living for one human being, which then failed, I would say. Uh, because the average doesn't fit anyone. I think that's the paradox of average. If you had an average shirt, it wouldn't fit anyone in this world. 
So uh, then brutalism in Yugoslavia, I think, didn't fail because it was appropriated in every sense. The rockets you showed, it was appropriate. It's not brutalism anymore. Every terrace has a different door frame, uh, window frames. Every house is kind of different. The hallways, everyone built the next hallway to kind of make their flats uh, more special. Okay. I mean, everybody. Oh, God. Like yeah, I was mostly referring to the exterior, so I've seen. Exterior as well. Exterior as well is not any more brutal anywhere. Like you have Mount Pizza, okay, it's a modest more, but it's, it looks like a painting almost. It doesn't look its original state. Or any brutal, any building with brutalism in the uh, Anyway, to respond to your previous question, which I think was that we tried to achieve something aesthetic in architecture. Yeah. This was exactly what I was trying to say in the conclusion. So it's obviously untenable to pretend as if new architecture can solve everything. And there are obviously very important purposes, such as spaces which can allow themselves to be unique, in which new architecture has no work to do. So these like, these are the spaces of complete aesthetic uh, freedom of, of where you hybridize utility and beauty in your own sense. And it's not a problem if you make a hotel or a restaurant or even some public space which isn't perfect in your architectural, because people get to experience something different. With time, maybe if these spaces become popular enough, they're really adept and you will need something new that will be surprising and unexpected. But if there are spaces where, where, where architecture can do actual harm, so we're not talking about the difference between what, what is tasteful, what is distasteful, what somebody likes or dislikes. So if you're making a hospital which actively prevents people from recovering, then you really have no other choice but to make a better hospital which allows people to recover. But if it's used to create the shopping malls that are going to uh, foster continuous shopping, <laughs> like that will make us do compulsive shopping, is it ethical or is it... Uh, well, is it ethical these, are, these are, for example, the limits of neuroscience. So neuroscience can only research into correlations really kind of course. So if you act, act impulsively all the time, and if you had no rational level of thinking, which would make you say, huh, I'm really not going to walk into eight shops one after another. No amount of new architectural coercion could make you do the, like, like your whole marathon through the shopping mall. Yeah, and if you don't have a proper dedication, so architecture can be even more. Exactly. So architecture is here. So, but actually, you said the greenery does support some sort of pain reduction, because a lot of the emotions we feel are very psychosomatic, and if you're uncomfortable because of some, because of what you see and what you interpret as uncomfortable, you're going to feel physically uncomfortable. Um, yeah, well, many thanks for this very intelligent um, run through through these theories. I wanted to discuss with you the consequences of what you have found, um, because uh, I believe that if you take the the idea of uh, neuroplasticity series, mm -hmm. then you can see that um, this paradigm or this belief of neurosciences as it evolved in the late 90s cannot be a hold any longer. That uh, when you said why neurosciences was sort of, sort of overtaking philosophy, you had, you had a very interesting um, um, image on the screen. You said that we found that there's a correlation between um, acts of consciousness and brain activity. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s, this, this correlation turned into a causal relation. Because of brain structure, you have this kind of consciousness, which is of course wrong. It's a, it's a wrong inclusion, a wrong deduction. You, you can always uh, have a correlation, but this doesn't mean that the brain causes us to think of a certain way. Uh, and if, if then no, no, you, uh, you it was, a, it was sorry. different theory. Um, sorry? So, uh, it was different theory. So my mistake, if I failed to elaborate more clearly, so the, this concept... Sorry, this was not my point. Let me get to my point before, before we discuss something that is not, not relevant. Um, I, I was saying that you rightly mentioned a finding of correlations and a certain set of theories in the early 2000s made of this correlation a causal relation, which is not found, actually. It cannot be scientifically proven. What I want to, to turn your attention to is that the idea of neuroplasticity has to do with something you mentioned very in the beginning of your talk, which is that the, the brain of mice uh, develops differently in different environments. That is and neuroplasticity. Yes. Neuroplasticity. See, and this would, would then uh, um, make you, I believe, uh, 
or would, I think when, when you take it radically, force you to leave a bit the setting or the paradigm of neuroscience in favor of, uh, of a philosophy of architecture, which would mean that you, that you see that even brains and, and very basic uh, physiological functionings depends on built environments. Uh, and you cannot find within brain structure or bodily structure any, any key to uh, explaining how, how environments need to be built, but rather inversely, you can see how much uh, the body is plastic and, and depends on the environment. And the, the beauty of your examples is, I think, that it shows that um, you don't need very rough uh, um, workings of the body like medicine, but you, you can have very light, um, uh, very light uh, um, impulses like um, high ceilings or showing green such that the body reacts in a certain way. That reminds me of a work of architects, uh, friend, architect friends of mine that had to, to design the um, restaurant on top of the German parliament. Um, and they wanted to, uh, to their, their, their task was to uh, make sure that there is not a suicidal attack every, or not, a su not, a, not every week someone would jump from the Reichstag, all right? And they don't want to build a fence nor a wall, which would physically um, depend on it, but in, in, in working with, um, with um, uh, criminologists, they found out that there's a high, high percentage of preventing people from stepping to the edge of the lifestyle uh, without them having to build a wall. And this is about the same findings that you have, that you don't need to plastic, you need to need plastic surgery in order to have um, bodies develop in a different way. It, certain, it needs a certain light arrangement, certain greens that you present, certain materials that you present, bridges that you build, which makes the, the, the body develop differently. So, conclusion, I think what you, what you find out is that uh, architecture can play a role in making the body develop differently. And then the question is, if, it, if, it, if there's this plasticity, what body do you want us to develop and with which architectural means? Well, here's the, uh, I skimmed over this because I didn't think we had enough time, but apparently now we do. So neuroplasticity cannot reverse all neural responses. It can make you more accustomed to very specific little habits. It can make you accept a certain aesthetic style which you didn't accept it before. But there are certain human responses and contingent mental states which cannot be, which cannot be altered by frequent exposure, so no matter what sort of architecture you see, you will never feel wakeful in a darkened space or a space that interferes with your circadian rhythm. This has been, they tried to prove this, they, they tried to make it happen on people, on mice, on rhesus monkeys, this never happened. So certain things which are so deeply in the evolutionarily set in, which have been continuously set in for thousands and thousands of years of human development are simply as such. So architecture can, tr can truly change our responses to the environment. So if you are very used to navigated, navigating, for example, very complex spaces, you become better at it with time. Or if you're exposed to very complex, complex aesthetics or heavily patterned spaces, you're also going to get more used to them with time, which is also the reason why architects tend to perceive new styles more, bene more benevolently than the general public because they're used to different levels of aesthetic exhibitions, they're used to, used to more novelty and more diversity. But there are certain mental states, there are certain responses which can never be uh, altered. And also, um, I, when I was talking about consciousness, and I was talking about this, uh, this idea about <coughs> mind-brain identity, um, it's not the idea that um, there is something which completely corresponds to your consciousness. This is the idea that every single particular, very small momentary mental process, such as an emotion or a thought, does have its neural correlate in the meaning that nothing can happen in your sense of a human being without something relatively correlated happening in your brain as a physical entity. And I mean, there's nothing which is supposed to be very dehumanizing or objectifying about neuroscience. It's actually supposed to be somewhat comforting so that you can understand the evolutionary or biological underpinnings of the things that you might be experiencing. It's not supposed to be, it's not supposed to reduce the human component of the human being or to negate anyone's intentionality. And the fact that, for example, we form our aesthetic preferences through neuroplasticity doesn't mean that they aren't our aesthetic preferences. It just might explain how they came to be. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, ah. that was a look up. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. For me, neuroscience is absolutely um, uh, an interesting and fundamental aspect of uh, uh, scientific aspect of the discipline of architecture today. Uh, so I have a kind of remark, uh, not to you, but to neuroscience in general. And that is that uh, because I, I, I'm following these things uh, from other uh, experts and scientists who work on that, and I have always the same discussions with them. And this is that the, the, let's say the, the, the scientists that work with their architecture don't know anything about architecture. Uh, neuroscience as itself, I mean, has, is older than psychology, is older than philo no, no, maybe even of philosophy itself, because neuroscience begins in the moment when when a ziggurat is, has been built, a pyramid has been built, and goes through all the centuries, through the conceptualization in the 15th, 16th century, and the architects are working on the notion of what is warm, what is cold, what is high, what, I mean, the history of emotions produced by architecture is older than maybe everything that we were talking today. So, my remark is that sometimes uh, working on the notions of uh, working on, on new instruments as virtual reality, as um, um, choosing maybe not the most beautiful architectures that we could really choose when we talk about archite architecture. Maybe we, we should go back to history. I'm sorry, I'm an architectural historian. I can talk just of things that I know. Is that maybe uh, walk through the Pantheon or uh, just uh, going to Alhambra in Granada maybe can say more than virtual reality. Because uh, uh, materiality, light, uh, uh, um, even the, the, our emotions that come from our really sensory experience through built architecture you can say much more than any kind of... Uh, so the role of uh, already built architecture, already existing and through centuries and through history, is maybe a good instrument to change. This is also just a small remark about brutalism. I mean, it is true that some of these uh, things that you said, and even, even the, the reaction on, on this kind of, let's say, style, or materiality of, of brutalism is problematic. But can we sometimes even say that maybe here in Yugoslavia, in ex-Yugoslavia, we have some extraordinary examples of brutalist architecture, which, uh, I mean, th the question is that you have to put, like in Belgrade, 500,000 people in 20 years, organize a city, organize like Speed 3, where you have to build in seven years a city of 50,000 people. I mean, architects, with together with anthropologists, together with uh, even sociologists, built incredible environments, incredibly interesting brutalist architecture, which is, means everything and, and nothing. Uh, so, I mean, sometimes to, to, cho to choose from the positive aspects of already built architecture some elements of really, of really something we need today is to what you were talking all the time, I mean, to how to build a better architecture that produces to us better efforts, better emotions, better... Uh, sorry, I don't yeah, I completely agree that existing architecture is definitely a stronger experience in virtual reality. I only show the picture of virtual reality because it's so bizarre. This is very rarely done because not many research centers have this sort of equipment. What's usually done is exposing examinants to existing architecture. This is exactly what you were talking about. Maybe their um, immediate bodily reactions were somewhat hindered because they had to wear these wireless helmets which might hurt their brain, but that would be about it. So because everyone's aware that you're going to have a much more honest experience if you're at one of those places that you actually mentioned. And when there is research on, for example, places of reverence, such as churches, they're never stimulated in the church because what's the point? They're always taken to an actual church. Or when you're trying to make people react to places of even negative recollections, such as places of memory, they're always taken to the exact site. You're not simulating their, their emotions. It's not so this is a, I, I had this uh, discussion with the uh, Italian uh, neuroscientist that he for two years was working on colors. Mm -hmm. And after two years he gave this conference and asked him, can you ever read it? <laughs> and he said, what? 
Kate, yeah. what Kate knows about colors. Mm. I mean, this is Ooh. a problem. You know, I mean, you lose two years of explaining the thing that has already been written. <laughs> but this is, I mean, it, in general, it's a question of methodology. That's, that's pretty to the general uh, method. Can I, can I say you something before your? Before? Before, sure, sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> because you, you mentioned, Luca, uh, at the beginning of your talk that you have some kind of debates with you about the name of syntax, you can say phrase, uh, philosophy of architecture and uh, or architecture of philosophy. Okay. Because I, I saw some kind of resistance uh, to you guys, architects. Because this is not your business, what kind of neuroscience is or not. You have, you have, uh, that's why I'm, I'm for philosophy of architectural philosophy. Why? Architectural philosophy, okay, this is, I think, Eisenman's syntagma from one interview with James, but never mind. Uh, architects, uh, this is this is very good example. Uh, philosophy as an instrument to you. You have philosophy as a bridge between neuroscience, in that case, and architecture. Uh, in this syntagma, architectural philosophy, you have some kind of, if you want, autonomy of architecture. In this, the other syntagma, philosophy of architecture is completely different because you need, in that case, philosophy as something, how to say, uh, uh, formed, already formed. I think that, for example, uh, I saw that architects uh, don't uh, know to write, for example. And this is my problem as a philosopher. I think that I know how to write. I saw that in your uh, if, if you are not Jörg, Jörg is good, yes. <laughs> or Peter. Well, well. If uh, you, you, uh, your texts are mess, uh, for example, terminological mess, and for example, in 50 years, with so many doctorates, PhD doctorates, because you, you must write now, in 50 years you will have your terminology. You will, have, you will classify you will have your language, etc., etc. I think that in this period of time, you need philosophy or some philosophical remarks just as instruments. Because really, what kind of argument you, you gave the argument? You are thinking about neuroscience. This is not a question of neuroscience. This is the question that you have some remarks very useful for your uh, designer business. Yeah? For your design, you have remarks, some, which is very good. I'm, I, I, I don't see the problem. Uh, you yes. said at the beginning, well, good, uh, it's fine for me, but neuroscience is a... No. It's not important, you know, it's not important. Or, for example, I know, uh, Carla, uh, and I, tomorrow I will talk about the same thing. There is a problem with the project, design, uh, conception, concept. One woman in Belgrade is writing the thesis about concept. Concept, begrip, begrip in, in architecture. Concept of architecture. You know, it's, it's impossible to say concept in English. It's conception, or in French. You have, there is a mess, and this is probably our business. Of, as philosophers, to help you to, to know how to talk about your work because you don't know how to talk about what you are doing. You are doing something, but you don't know. You have you know, many examples that you are confirmed this as, a, as, a, as a, it's true. And, uh, I, you know, uh, I, I saw some kind of resistance, artistical resistance, because you, you'd like to be artist. And here you had some very examples, good examples, how to, uh, to, to, to help you uh, with your, well, your design, I think. Probably I'm wrong. 
<laughs> that was absolutely, uh, maybe I expressed myself sadly in a badly way, I said, I'm, excuse me, but I'm no, not no, thinking no. like that. I, I mean, on contrary, I'm saying that this is great. Yeah. This is a great thing. I was just um, trying to have even more results, from every possible result that could be really useful to my discipline from the point of view of psychology, from the point of view of sociology, even, I mean, the, the philosophy, so, so to enrich my knowledge of how my brain works, how our, our brain works, in, in general, in a particular way. Uh, my remark was strictly on the methodological level, not yeah. on the content of your uh, presentation, even of, of the of the no, importance, the science, of, course, yeah. of, of, the importance of, of this, uh, and I was Really, I, I will repeat it, but my friend was working two years on the uh, reaction on colors and knows nothing about art history and even never, never saw a, a red Gate because that was the beginning of the, theory, of the theory of color. So may, m most of his research was already written, was already... I mean, he could obtain more, much more interesting result after having read and maybe saw a couple of uh, artists that worked on the, on, on the perception of colors and so on and so on. So. But j just a question of methodology, not a question of the importance of this field. This is just... Sorry. Okay. Professor Leiter? So, Luca, you talked about Goethe. <laughs> Goethe and colors and no, Turner. No, <laughs> he was not that wrong, Goethe, with this uh, no. color. Uh, philosophy. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to make a comment on, on yours. I think um, there are some really interesting um, aspects. Of course, it's very provocative, for especially for architects, because architects pretend or think, or actually it's also our duty to teach them to use their brain and their common senses. And you talk about situations where there's no architect. And um, <clears throat> so that neuroscience can help in a planning process, which is very complex, just like in hospital. It's really complex that often there are no architects um, um, part of, of the team. Or if there are architects, they call themselves architects, but they are specialists for certain areas. So as I understood, as you said, in 1814, there starts a kind of a process of differentiation of sciences. It starts with the <coughs> neurosciences, with physiology, and Leipzig, and Heidelberg, with the Helmholtz, and Wund, and so on. And that neuroscience is one of, is part of this differentiation now with the new technologies of the computer and so on, the digital uh, tools that we can now trace um, somehow the effects of visual or sensual experience in, in the brain and also evaluate it. So well, this is um, um, you, you read positively or negatively and we can now evaluate it also in, in dimensions where it was maybe formerly not as clearly possible. Um, but I think it's, um, it's interesting that now we have architects have to deal with one more science. It's neuroscience. So there's the plumbers, there's the electricians, um, there's the people for the money and for the, for, for the material and, and so on. There's one more science they have to deal with in those special situations when they are not able anymore to control the process. This, I, I find, this is what I understood from your talk. Because um, when they open the window which goes to the outside is of course pleasant. This is what architects know and not only architects. This is about, this is common wisdom. But there are situations, obviously, in modern architecture where the, the tasks, the projects grow so big that they are, the process is so difficult to control that certain, you know, our common wisdom is lost. It doesn't help us anymore. And then maybe a neuroscientist has to come and say, look, you have to do this and this and this. Do something with the lighting here, make something with greenery here, make an opening here, um, and, and so on. I think it's perfect. Um, but we have to maybe to limit uh, maybe the, the, the field of action for the neuroscientists, maybe for these really big pro projects. 
And I would say uh, it's still, I, uh, I think it's still our task in university to, to teach students who have the courage to use their brain <laughs> and use common knowledge that certain things work best in a certain way, that there are certain standards. And probably then neuroscience, we don't have to neuroscience. Uh, it's because you might think that these conclusions are very intuitive. It's good to know that they're yeah, neuroscience. Yeah, yeah. But this maybe it's because the intuitive and the common sense as well can be treated as banal by very complex architectural theories. Yeah. And this is a big basic problem. So I think that neuroscience can help for certain certain projects or certain um, problems. Um, but maybe it, is, it was not as thought as um, deterministic as it was somehow uh, perceived, uh, maybe from the audience. I, I had a feeling that you're trying to locate neuroscience somehow in the vast field of, of, of sciences and try um, to establish those cases where neuroscience can help to enhance certain effects or exactly. maybe prevent others. That's exactly it. So, it, maybe okay, we, we can leave it for another, another occasion. It's a <laughs> okay, then, uh, briefly, just uh, the, the thing is that uh, besides uh, psychological evolution, there is epigenetics uh, also related to uh, what we inherited and changes that were evaluated during the process of the um, conception uh, and uh, changes that uh, are also uh, produced after that. So it's not that we are only constructed through educational process, but it's uh, the, uh, something that uh, uh, made us uh, um, live in a, in a certain uh, manner. The, the only thing with the uh, uh, neurosciences and we've been talking about it uh, um, for, for, from the, uh, this morning uh, is that uh, besides uh, linguistics, besides philosophy of mind, besides uh, all this uh, 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 physiological aspects, we do have uh, artificial intelligence and we do have uh, now um, so so um, enrooted especially in younger generations uh, this uh, 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 artificial reality uh, through uh, gaming uh, through uh, uh, the, the, the things that when you said your thought experiment and I heard it as a thought experiment actually with those two uh, opposites uh, uh, having dogs uh, uh, adapting kind of naturally to the situation and uh, responding naturally to the situation and those uh, raised and uh, formed in a, in a very specific totalitarian aspect of not giving them any freedom. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, now come back uh, to the experiment, uh, uh, experience of, of uh, neural architecture uh, in this aspect of letting some room for freedom uh, in a sense of uh, choice. And it's not. Uh, uh, I, I saw. I saw the project um, some somehow fashionable because it's uh, like any uh, um, development in, in sciences or technologies. Uh, it's it's very important uh, for architects to uh, uh, to deal with it and to understand that their previous intuitions that they already saw in Renaissance uh, perspective, for example with greenery and, and things like that, that, that can be uh, pre-monitored and uh, constructed in, in, into what they are uh, designing. That's, that's uh, important. But somehow we should just uh, take it cum cano salis. It's like it's not the only answer. And that's why I understood well 
uh, Lucas uh, uh, comment because that's that's the, that's the thing. Uh, it would be enough to go and to see Turner uh, and stay in front of Turner for for half an hour and then go back and do the experiment with neurosciences and develop it through uh, uh, encephalographer or uh, RMI or all this and then compare it. So we need, we, we, really, we really need to read Goethe, uh, if not for anything else, but to uh, recognize how genius he was in formulating, rephrasing something that we can now uh, mm, discover through technology. Uh, that, that's uh, that's uh, why I'm, I'm quite uh, uh, with you in, in this aspect. But it's not only a fashionable thing. We should really use this uh, uh, aspects of uh, development in, in uh, uh, cognitive sciences and technologies. Uh, in, uh, we, we have a lot of architects now working in developing uh, games. Uh, so that, that's it. And so make it more human, even though it's very nasty, more human, but we are living in an Anthropocene. So uh, going back to uh, redefining even what the human is, uh, what, what is it that we need, and uh, uh, what are the sensibility of things. Uh, that's how I understood, for example, uh, your address work. Uh, to senses uh, in that in that uh, term. Thank you. Uh, I know it's too long. I would like to yes. also to add a critical remark, <laughs> a remark on your presentation. Because you showed in, for example, the, the church of Botruba in Indiana. Have you been there? Did I? Yes, you did. Can you show? Can you show? Can you... It was what, next what to the Sacred, I think, to the Sacred um, <laughs> thing. Can you go? There was nothing in Vienna against the Sacred. Can you? Can you show? There is literally no choice, no, no chance yeah. there's anything from Vienna in this presentation. Okay. I don't really know for it. Where? Um, um, no, no, not this. Maybe down or up or down, I don't know. Okay. That's Boston. Yes. Yeah. Oh. This one. This is Wotkuba. This is um, this is a church Which in Austria the, on the left hand side, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yes, this Wotkuba is. Um, he was an artist. He was not an architect. And um, well, I think much a uh, bit of the resistance maybe here comes from the usage of these um, images because this is an excellent piece of architecture. It is not disturbing. Actually, if you know, you go in there and you are. Electrified somehow. I don't imagine know. There so was this and you you showed it as a negative example. Also the uh, Paul Rudolph um, architecture building. This here is the Yale University campus. Exactly. Which is yeah. It's extremely is hated. It is now ex extremely loved. I've been there last year in December. It's now renovated. It's incredible spaces. The people, uh, the students like it. Maybe the resistance to this building um, in the nineteen. Uh, late 60s had a different reason for it. it but these are really building, sorry, these positive are positive buildings or, or also in terms of neuroscience, I'm sure that you can show that if the people are there, then they feel good or they feel something positive. I think, so here it becomes a little bit uh, difficult, your, your argument. No, uh, this is uh, exactly the point, is that our socially situated, hmm. socially influenced reactions yeah. aren't strictly neurological. This is what I'm trying okay. to argue for, that we can somewhat alter our reactions and expectations if we're con continuously used to something. And back when this was fresh, and back when this was new, people, people hated it immensely. And uh, the fact that it's now loved uh, kind of stems from a complete, completely different... Yeah, but this has to do with cultural conventions, you know? Not with, uh, people have been conditioned to like this, now yeah. we have a different cultural environment which people can... Well, they can get to know brutalism yeah. from many perspectives. I just wanted to think that, that you maybe distinguish more between the neuroscience uh, part and, and, this, and the cultural uh, part. Yes. yes, thank you. I <laughs>
In the conclusion, there are also these yeah. questions about yeah. the tradition, so, culture, and you know, how they yeah. influence. Mm -hmm. Okay, the I take.